Okay, well, we're going to be doing uh, part four of this, in this strong series, and uh, I'm going to open my Bible to uh, Joshua, just kind of hold it there, because that's where I'm going to be talking from. Uh, it'll take me a couple minutes to get there, but this, this series came, the, the Bible says that pastors are supposed to know the condition of their flock. We're referred to as shepherds underneath of the ultimate shepherd, Jesus, and that we're supposed, to, we're supposed to pay attention to what's going on in, in your lives. So that if you ever see a, a strange person looking through the windows of your house, that's me. <laughs> or, or one of our leaders and with a clipboard. Um, but no, honestly, I'm supposed to be praying for you, and I'm supposed to be like, God, what's going on in the church? And I really felt like this was a series you needed. I felt like it was a series I needed, you needed, because summer's coming. And I see it every summer. I see people fall out of church and fall away from God. Summer is not naturally a spiritual, it's, it's not a spiritual season in the, in the cycles. Uh, we, we just came out of one. And I thought, man, how good it would be if you didn't have to backslide and then get it all right again in September, but that you could just keep growing spiritually through the summer. Wouldn't that be awesome? Man, I, I know. That's, that's where I'm at. And the Bible says a final word, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Be strong. Look at somebody next to you and say, be strong. I just want to say it so many times in this series because I think, you know, we have to pat each other on the back sometimes. Say, be strong, brother. Be strong. Be strong. You know, you want to set yourself up for a summer of fun. Man, I'm all about summer is nature, outdoors. It's grilling out. It's spending time with friends. It's, uh, summer is a very fun, vibrant, lively season. And I think you can have all of that fun and not lose your morals. You can remain strong in the Lord through the summer, not lose your marriage, not lose your home. Uh, and But what is a strong person in the Lord? Is a person who exercises, there's this term in the Bible that we should exercise unto godliness. It's a person who exercises unto godliness. You know, we go to the gym to get muscles. You know, we go to the Bible, we go to prayer to get spiritual fortitude, to get strong, right? You can either be weak or strong. You have to ask yourself, am I weak or am I strong? How much temptation would it take to blow you over right now? If you're scared, if you feel like, my God, if I was just in the wrong place, I would just fall away from God, then take that as an indication you've got to pay attention to this sermon. It's a gift from God because God wants to make you strong, so strong that you almost wake up in the morning and say, bring it on. Anything, bring it on. And I don't think we want to have that kind of attitude that we're, that we're out there necessarily in pride. But we want to be so confident in God that when we wake up in the morning, we're not afraid of the devil, but he's afraid of us. You know? Like, oh, God, he's up again. You want to make the devil pray. <laughs> Did you get that? So, so I gave you, I'm giving, giving you five exercises, and today on Father's Day, I want to talk about uh, raising your standards or the exercises that you need to raise your standards. I think standards are very important. If you want to be a strong person, then you have to decide what you're going to believe. Ahead of time, uh, you have to decide what you're going to believe. And, you know, um, t Tony Robbins had this quote I saw this morning when I was Googling. It says, if you want to change your life, you have to raise your standards. And I agree with that. If you want to raise your life, you want to change your life, you have to raise your standards. So I want you to look at someone next to you and say, raise your standards. Right? You're like, God, man, maybe I need to. Now, I want to give you this story in the book of Joshua. So Moses, Moses delivers Israel out of Egyptian slavery. He brings them into this promised land that God had, uh, that, that, well, into the wilderness. And then, you know, there's a generation that dies in the wilderness. And there's, there are sermons and volumes of sermons to be spoken in all, each of these phases. But it's the end of 40 years after Israel had come out of the Red Sea and now another generation is rising up in faith. There was an unbelieving generation, and they only went partially into God's promise. And now Joshua rises up and he goes, let's do it. The whole generation says, let's do it. They go into the promised land. And God just delivers the land into their hands. It's an amazing, uh, it's an amazing time for Israel. And, wow, I just got an extra piece of jerky that was in my beard. Awesome. See, that's why I keep this thing. Uh, just amazing. So all the guys are going to go to kiss your wives later, and it's going to be like, wow, you have, you have jerky breath. 
It's like salami breath. It's just horrible. Um, next year, we'll put a piece of gum in there with it. But then mint-flavored jerky is probably nasty. <laughs> uh, but So what happens is Joshua, Joshua gets to the very end of his book. And he's in Joshua, in his book, Joshua 24. He's at the end of the book. He knows that his life is kind of getting, you know, he's getting older now. And he starts recapping. Man, there's so much jerky coming in my beard, I'm afraid it's going to like, there's stabbing pieces that are going in sideways. That is just amazing. Where is it? Anybody want some? I mean, you just come get it. So... If Ming Me, my pug, was here, man, she would be destroying my face right now. I can just tell you that. You couldn't back her up. Uh, but Joshua starts saying, hey, God did all this stuff for you, and I want everyone right now just to think, what has God done in your life? Everyone, in the balcony, on the floor, God has done so many amazing things, everyone has a story to tell. Don't you? He, and he says, Joshua says, don't forget it's God that did it for you. Don't think you did it. Moses says it exactly like that, but Joshua's kind of saying that, and he gets down there and he realizes that a lot of people haven't made up their mind about God yet. And it's amazing. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. God will do so much in our lives before we really commit to him. And Joshua was realizing that the nation had not really, truly made a firm decision to commit to God. They were kind of like with God for a little while, and then they were back in their idols, and then they were with God, and they were back in their idols. And this was a huge problem for Israel. And Joshua stands up as the leader of the nation, and he goes, enough! That's what he said, kind of. And he's, everybody's like, Joshua is being so like spiritual right now. Joshua, we can't handle you. It's, we're going into summer. We don't want this sermon. And, but Joshua basically says this. He says in verse 14 of 24, and it's not going to be on the screen. I just want to read it to you. Just listen to it roll off of my lips with the jerky. So honor the Lord and serve him wholeheartedly. Put away forever your idols that you ancestor, that you, your ancestors worship. And, and, uh, Serve the Lord alone. But if you are unwilling to serve the Lord, then choose today whom you will serve. And he goes, if you prefer these gods or these gods, then go and do that. But as the famous verse that we use in all the men's conferences, this is a man up verse right here. But as for me and my house, he stands up and he goes, we will serve the Lord. And everyone was like, dude, I got chills. That guy's preaching. Come on, guys. And as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so, you know, when I read that, I I think to myself, each person must choose for yourself who you will serve. You have to choose this. You can't wake up every day and just be blown around. You know, the media is saying this, and... Tom Cruise is saying this, and Billy Joel is saying this, and whoever is saying that, and Lady Gaga is saying this. You've got to choose what you will believe and not fall prey to the shifting popular opinions that exist in the world, and it's always changing, and ideas are always changing, and I love the fact that this Bible is so timeless I was thinking the other day, I was, it's amazing. This thing is written so many thousands of years ago, and I can still read this, and it makes sense to me. And it, like, talks to me. And it doesn't need to be rewritten. It's just so unbelievable how the Bible works. And, and so I thought this is the perfect text for Father's Day because I believe that there's a warrior nature in every man to defend what is his. I know this in the, the, the days of feminism and everything, uh, women, you can be powerful too. My wife kickboxed me in the face and gave me a bloody nose one time on accident. Um, so it's fine. You can be powerful. But men were created to be powerful. Let's hear it, men. Woo, woo, woo. Come on, guys. Right? So I want to get the men so fired up today. You guys are going to go home, take your shirt off, and be like, honey, check that out. Right there. So... Um, so this message is not just about fathers. It's about, it's, it is for everyone to raise your standards. It just so happens that this 
is a man who stood up in his nation as a leader in his nation and said, we've got to make a choice. Because if you don't choose, and then he ends up doing this covenant with them. And they put this big rock up, and they said, this is the memorial of the covenant that we made with God. And then if you go to Judges, you find out that when Joshua died and all the people who outlived Joshua from his generation, that everyone walked away from God. And because of that, the book of Judges is so spectacular. Because of that, there are these cycles of people falling away from God. Judgment comes into their lives. They, they face a penalty. Then they cry out to God. God raises up a judge who delivers them from the hand of their enemies. And then as soon as they get back to life being good again, they fall away from God. And this happens over and over and over for a long period of time. Joshua was trying to keep that from happening because when you set a standard, you can break that cycle in your life. Do you want to break that cycle in your life? Because I know that you know what I'm talking about. You have to make that decision. Now, the Bible says then we will no longer be like immature children. We won't be tossed and blown by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies. So clever they sound like truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of the body, his body, the church. Um, standards are pillars for the soul. You, you can update parts of your life, but standards must be set in concrete. They are the pillars. You can change lots of stuff about your life. I heard a sermon years ago, we, we change methods, but not the message. The same message with new methods. That's how you combine relevance with, tr with holding the truth. The same message with new methods. And so we have to be very careful to hold the standards up in our life. Come on, guys. You know I'm telling you the truth today. Before you go on a date, you have to know how far you'll go. Before you go to the party, you have to know if you'll drink or you won't drink. If you'll do drugs or you won't do drugs, you have to know if you should go to that party or not. And when you're in a new relationship, you have to have conversations to set boundaries in those relationships. My God, you're sounding so old school today. Well, let me just do it once a year and, and help you raise your standards with your friends you might have to say to your friends, guys, I've got these standards. I don't want to be self-righteous, but I have these standards. I feel like I'm breaking my standards whenever we're together. And you have to figure that out. You have to work through that. Husbands and wives, you need to figure this out for your home. What goes and what stays? What's allowable and what's not allowable? Right? There was something, Marcia, uh, your husband called you Dale, but there was something, what was the saying? I know you guys will remember it. What was the saying that he had? He said that everyone's welcome into his house, but if you don't, basically if you don't agree, you don't have to come there. What was it? Was that pretty close? He said, man, everyone's welcome to my house. You can just see it. Everyone's welcome. But if you don't agree with the rules of this house, then you don't have to stay. You don't have to come. You have a right. Listen, you're paying that mortgage. You're paying that rent. You have a right to setting standards in your domain. Man, yes. If you don't police your territory, the darkness will destroy your territory. You have to on purpose. And Joshua had a family meeting with the nation to raise the standards. That's exactly what he did. He had a family meeting. He says, you guys got to make up your mind, but we're going to deal with this right now. As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. And he drew a, a line, basically, and he stepped back. And then people go, yes. And one by one, they started coming over the line. And then when they got there, he turned around and he said, do you know what you're doing? Let's make a covenant with God and don't ever forget that you made this covenant. He made it serious with them. That when you decide that you're going to serve the Lord, then that is a pillar in your life. It's not the kind of thing that you're going to bend and flex and move around. Um, so my proposition to you today, my promise is that every person can, you can raise your standards by making a few choices. These are moral choices that you're going to make in your life. And if you're taking notes, these are the things you want to write down. And I'm going to give you three moral choices, I think, that, you, that every person in this room should make with your life. I, I don't, young and old, this is relevant. 
These are three choices. If you haven't made them yet, make them today. If you made them and forgot them, re-up them today. Three moral choices. And the first choice that I'd love for everyone to make is, I choose to be, now look at this, I choose to be stubborn instead of spineless. You're going to go, one person said yes and got this. Everybody else is going, is he asking us to be stubborn? I thought we're not supposed to be stubborn. Well, let me tell you how I got this idea from a very stubborn individual. I bounce my sermons off of people, and I go, I'm thinking about preaching this. What do you think about that? Well, I happened to spend some time with Corey this week. Went with him to North Carolina. He preached adventure missions in the church. It was an unbelievable, like, 22-hour trip, round trip. And we had a great time. There's, There's Corey at one of his missions. And that's such a good picture, by the way. My God. I pulled it off of your Facebook, and I was like, he's so cool. Um. And so I said to Corey, I was like, Corey, you've always had good standards in your life. Um, like, like, honestly, if you only knew the people Corey hung out with when he was a kid, as a parent, we were terrified all the time. We're like, my God, he is with the worst people on planet Earth. But they sure are nice. <laughs> We're like, I think he knows what he's doing. Oh, my God. And Emily used to, no offense to any of his friends right now, but Emily used to say they're like in the Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer cartoon movie at Christmas time. They're like the island of misfit toy. He's like the island of misfit toys. He hung, he had Buddhists and atheists and who knows what, what he had in his circle. But I was like, are you still a Christian? Yep. Okay, I just make it sure. Uh, do you still know what you believe? Yep. Uh, yeah. Okay. All right, cool. And he had these real high standards when he was growing up. And I thought, how does he have standards around those kinds of people? So I asked him, I was like, Corey, I'm intrigued. How do you have standards? He goes, I think you have to be stubborn. And I was like, no wonder you were so good at this. No wonder you were so good at this. And so basically, Corey's not a good person because he's a good person. He's turned his weakness into a strength. <laughs> I'll get, take a second for that to trip in what I just said to you about my son. It was very difficult to raise him because I'm stubborn too, and it's so dangerous. I, told, I think I told this like a while back. There was only one time Corey actually stood up like he was going to fight me, and I was like, this is the last day of my life. I was like, I was like, uh, 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 and he's like, I wish you would. And I was like, uh-oh, now what? <laughs> I'm in a new frontier. And then he held back. He's held back. Being his size, he could have destroyed me so many times over the years. But he chose not to. And I thank God for that. But what I learn is that his stubbornness is a virtue. Somebody goes, I don't believe it. Let me give you some scripture. Well, before I give you some scripture, I was I did some, you know me, I like to find some fun stuff. So I did this, I did this search for stubborn, funny videos, and I found this guy. Check it out. Emmett Pearson was a diehard Minnesota Vikings fan, and when they lost in the third Super Bowl against the Pittsburgh Steelers in 75, he decided that he was not going to shave until the Vikings won. Anyone that is a Vikings fan knows that they have not won a Super Bowl after 1969. It did not help that he needed surgery on an artery in his neck, and he refused to have the surgery unless the doctors promised not to shave his beard. I made a vow, and I'm going to stick with it, Pearson told a reporter. His wife did not like his beard and wished that he shaved it, especially after he needed surgery. He died in 2013 when he was 83 years old and never got rid of the beard. I admire that man for having convictions. And I understand the struggle is real when my wife grabs my beard and pulls me in close and she goes, this is what I want for my birthday. <laughs> On a platter. But you, still, you see who still has a beard. No, I got to be careful. I don't want to turn it into a competition because she's stubborn too. So I got to release the pressure. No competitions because then that's dangerous. But you're in the dog-eat-dog world, as they say, and you need to have a spine to survive it. And God placed stubbornness in his greatest prophets. This is how they survived and fulfilled their mission for God. Stubbornness. Let me give you a couple of verses here. Have you ever heard of a guy named Ezekiel? God said to Ezekiel, but the people of Israel won't listen to you any more than they'll listen to me. For the whole lot of them is hard-headed and stubborn. But look, 
I've made you as obstinate, as hard-headed as they are. I have made your forehead as hard as the hardest rock. See, oh man, I don't want to get him myself. So don't be afraid of them or fear their angry looks, even though they are rebels. God said that I'm giving you this new grace in your life. I'm going to make you hard-headed. Somebody goes, God does that? Yeah, see, stubbornness is not the problem. It's what you're going to be stubborn about. Having a backbone is not a problem. See, the churches in the last 10 or 20 years have preached humility so hard that we've got a group of spineless, we have a a spineless church these days. It's okay to have a spine. You just have to know what to have a spine about and how to exercise that spine. And so, and so look at this one. How many of you ever heard of this guy named Jeremiah? Yep. Jeremiah was a bullfrog. No, Jeremiah the prophet. I love frogs. They will fight against you like an attacking army. Let me tell you, this is what God says to every person going into ministry because it happens. Like this is, Emily, is this true? They will fight against you like an attacking. Who wants to go into ministry? They will fight against you like an attacking army as they smile at you with their devious little loving comments. They will fight against you like an attacking army, but I will make you as secure as a fortified wall of bronze. They will not conquer you, for I am with you to protect you and rescue you. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will make you as secure as a and fortified as a wall of bronze. I will make you stubborn. I will make you immovable. I will make you secure. I will make you stronger than the opposition coming against you. They will fight against you, but they will not prevail over you. There are verses that said, no weapon formed against you will prosper, and every tongue that rises up against you will be cast down. God can make you strong. He can make you bold as a lion. Can you say that with me? I'm bold as a lion. See, God knew what he was, that he was sending Ezekiel to wicked people and that he would not survive without stubbornness. God couldn't take somebody who was over-feeling. He had to take somebody, and I've said to God over the years, if I could just not feel so much, I think I could be more effective. Because it hurts when people hurt me, right? I just hate that. I, I, was, I was actually, no offense to whoever this individual is, but I was like, God, I would even become like that individual before I continue to be like me. This individual is a little more prideful, a little more, but, and I used to look at prideful people and go, you're so prideful, but now I look at people who are overly broken and weak, and I go, well, you're cowardly. We have to walk the balance, man. We have to walk in between there. We have to have courageous humility. Come on, guys. You're trying to figure out who it is. So sometimes it's bad to be hard-headed, but sometimes it's very good to be hard-headed. When you're around these people, you will not falter. They will not make you like them is what God is saying. You will have the grace of stubbornness, and you will remain in complete authority of your own soul. You will be unaffected by everything they're bringing against you. Do you feel sometimes that, that society is just like descending upon you and changing you? I was in a trial a couple years ago, and I was like, I, uh, I started to get cynical. And I told Emily, I was like, man, I just, I hope I never just like really flip out. Because I've taken a lot over the years. I hope one day I just don't come in and just cuss out the church and just put down the microphone and walk away. And people will be like, dog, that just went down, <laughs> right? Um, and I hope to God that never happens. It's Actually, it's one of my fears. Um, but so far, 14 years, hasn't happened yet. And I've had lots of opportunities to have that happen. But I remember one time that I was, I was starting to complain a lot. Um, I was starting to, like, say really bad things about the church, about ministry, about people, I was just getting to the point where I was becoming very bitter in my soul. Have you ever been there? Thank you for your honesty. Have you ever been there? Man, I was there. I'll never forget this. And I told my wife, I said, I'm so afraid right now that I'm losing my character. 
Like, I'm afraid that a couple of years from now I'm going to be that guy that has no trespassing signs all over his yard and a, and a, and a pile of guns, and I'm going to answer the door with a gun to the person with the Jesus track, and I'm going to tell him to get off my property, and my pit bull is going to attack him to the property boundary. Like, how can a guy go from being preacher with his doctorate, published author, preaching around the world to that? I'm using this extreme example to say it can happen to anyone if you're not careful. If you're not careful, you don't hold on to your standards. You could lose yourself. You could lose your character. And I don't want to see that happen to anyone. And you know what? I have seen that happen to people. Have you? And you go, how did that happen? He or she was just, wow, man. Just And now, how did that happen? How did that happen? It can happen. And if it's happened to you, Get back in the race. Make the decision today that you are going to be more stubborn against the thing. You know what the devil really wants? He wants you away from God. That is the one thing he wants to do in every trial you face in life. That is the one he wants you to curse God and die. He wants you to curse God and die. Have you made a decision that you will never do that? Job made that decision that he would never do that, curse God and die. And uh, Doug Brooks... um, Doug Brooks was, uh, him, him and I were on my patio. You probably saw that video on my Facebook. It had a couple of thousand views on it and lots of comments. And, and Doug's actually famous now. I, can't, I haven't been able to talk to him in several days, and he won't return my calls. And um, uh, all, all he did was he sent me an autograph in the mail. I didn't even ask for it. Um, but, but Doug Brooks was at my house, and I was asking. I was talking about Joshua. There he is. Look at him. There's Amy over there. Was, was, oh, look at that. That's such a good picture of you guys, man. Don't you guys think? And uh, so keep that up there for a while. Make it feel awkward. And, but uh, I said to Doug, I said, Doug, how in the world did you drive out the darkness? Because he's like, you don't understand how lost I was, how addicted to methamphetamines I was, how horrible I was. Only my wife and kids can ever tell the tales, you know, of the person that I was. I was so dark. I was so lost. I was so angry. I was one of the worst people. And I'm like, how did you drive all of that out? And Doug basically said the same thing. And I thought, he's another stubborn person. Isn't it amazing the way God uses stubborn people when they direct their stubbornness? And Doug, and Doug said, he said, well, I'll tell you what. I'm going to give you Doug's version of this. He goes, uh, Ryan, you want to come up here and do this for me? Because Ryan can do a really good Doug Brooks. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Ryan, you want to come up here and give a Doug Brooks real quick? Come, how many of you want to hear Ryan do a Doug Brooks? Come on. <laughs> Ryan's going to do a Doug Brooks right now. <laughs> just real fast, just improv, Doug Brooks. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the Lord was uh, telling me that uh, Amy needed to uh, uh, listen to me. Not- anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Doug is one of the most humble people I know. But when it comes time to fight for something he believes in, this man has the biggest backbone I've ever seen. I mean, the hair stands up on the back of his neck, and he's like, back off. And he stands and fights for what's his. But Doug said, Doug said this to me. I declared war on my property. And he, he said, I commanded everything evil to get off this property. He said, I'd be walking around my property. I'd be telling the devil, get off. I'd go to every boundary. I'd go to the road, and I'd say, you get off of here, and you get out of my house. He said, I poured so much oil on the doorposts of my house that sometimes you walk under, it'll drip on your head. He said, I've poured oil. I've prayed like they did in the Old Testament. I prayed over my house. I prayed over my family. And I told the devil that I was going to take back everything taken from me. Man, some people just need to get to that point of saying enough. I'm not going to let life be the way it is, but I am going to get stubborn on those things in, that have been destroying my life. And Doug said, this is the way he, he said, praise is my instrument of warfare. And he said, I wouldn't just yell out loud at the devil, but I would praise God, and I would welcome God to my property, and I'd welcome God over my family, and I would declare. And Doug even said, when my kids were being baptized, uh, or, or uh, was it being, being uh, dedicated to the Lord, he said, I took that as sacred, and I believed that God came into covenant with my kids, and I stood on that, 
And I told the devil, those kids belong to God, and you will back up. You will not have them forever. It's real nice to know that Dustin's serving God and Doug are serving God now and that his kids have grown so much out of all the things that were wrecking their lives. But man, it didn't just happen by chance. Dustin just didn't decide to come to church one Sunday. There was warfare over their home. And, and Doug and Amy decided to not settle with defeat in their home. You've got to be stubborn instead of spineless. And you got to declare war over some things. And, and uh, oftentimes we're not serious about the rituals of our faith. We let the enemy come in and out of our lives. I wrote in my notes, I cannot raise the standards in your life and in your home, but you can. Can you say yes? Doug was the stubborn aggressor who drove out the enemy. And I think that there are people listening to me now, maybe even on the internet, that this message is kind of like creating that moment for you where you're going to go, you know what, life has not been ideal, circumstances have not been ideal, and you know what, enough is enough. I'm the person in spiritual authority. I remember learning this in Bible college years ago. Somebody said in, in one of the books I was reading, it said, said, the devil must look at us sometimes and see all the power of God, the blood of Christ, the spiritual authority, and wonder why we don't just stand up and blow him away. He must be perplexed at how much victory he has over our lives when compared to how much victory Jesus won for us on his cross. And enough is enough, Right? Come on, guys, right? So you want to establish the right. Doug even said this. He said, I pour oil on the doorpost. When someone walks underneath this header, they are passing through a metal detector. And he said, stuff doesn't make it in. I was like, wow, man, that's awesome. You have to decide, is your, is your home going to be joyous? Is the Bible going to be read in there? Is there going to be prayer in your house? Humility, honesty. What kind of virtues are going to be found over your property? You know, I just look at like Lord of the Rings and you come into certain places, certain realms of kingdoms and they're completely different than other parts of, of the world. And, and, and there are some homes you walk into and you feel defeated when you walk through the door. It's like a dark cloud over the house. There are other homes you walk into and there's more victory in there than there is in most churches. And, and there's differences in atmospheres, but you know who controls that? I do. You do. As for me and my house... We will serve the Lord, and I'm going to be stubborn about that. So the second choice you have to make is I choose to be true instead of trendy. I choose to be true. Now, I'm going to have to explain this a little bit because I, I just wanted to be poetic with my, with my statements so that you could remember them real easy. Stubborn instead of spineless, true instead of trendy. The idea here is I'd rather be right than popular, you know, that kind of idea. But you're going to be true, true, to what you believe instead of falling into every trend. Falling into every trend. Now, the last, the last point was about the attitude that you're going to have. You know, um, the, the stubbornness that it takes. This, in this idea, in this choice, that you're going to choose to dismiss popularity if you must. To, to live in, in your standard. If you're going to have standards, let me tell you, then you're going to stand out. There will be times you'll stand out and guess what? Not be popular. Does that hurt anyone? That was the most awkward silence in 14 years of preaching. I just, I waited for an extra long second. It felt like 20. Well, that, honestly, I feel like I just bungee jumped. I literally sweat came out of all my pores. It was just the ultimate shutdown. Uh, I'm on the floor right now. My knee is bent backwards, and I just got stuffed. Um, no, I don't think that's what happened. I think you guys were processing, <laughs> maybe. I choose to be true to myself than to be trendy. There's always a new trend coming through, coming through the church, coming through the world, coming through the lyrics and songs. There's always a new trend so there's always a new trend. You know, some people, they literally are just riding the trends. And you have to be a person of conviction who is going to be true to yourself, true to God, instead of being blown around, as we read in that verse. Let me give you a couple of verses here about this. If the world hates you, by the way, these are the words of Jesus to his disciples. If the world hates you, remember what? It hated me first. The world would love you as one of its own if you belong to it, but you're no longer part of this world. 
I choose you to come out of the world so it hates you. I choose you to come out of the world. And we, we really don't preach these verses much anymore, but these are the words of Jesus. They should come up frequently. Red letters, red letter verses should make it into lots of sermons because these are the words of Jesus, our Savior. He said, if the world hates you, remember, it hated me first. Don't always try to escape the uneasiness that comes from living a standard and being made to feel like you don't belong. Because guess what? You don't belong. This world is not your home. Man, I know you sound, he's, man, I haven't heard those phrases in a long time, but this world is truly not our home. And yet we do so much to sink into it as much as absolutely possible. If you try to hang on to your life, you will what? But if you give up your life for my sake, you will what? Save it. And what benefit will if you gain the whole world but lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Yes or no? For the Son of Man will come with his angels. I even left this extra verse on there. For the Son of Man will come with his angels in the glory of his Father and will judge all people according to their deeds. That's like gulp stuff right there, but we, we have to, every once in a while, we have to tell ourselves we're going to give an account before God for everything we do in this life. I don't want to think about that any more than anyone in this room does. But we are going to stand before God one day, and I want to make sure that I was true instead of trendy. That when popularity collided with my convictions, I chose my convictions. And I chose to stand out. I'd rather be true than trendy or popular. People these days seem to desire too much acceptance from others. Can you say yes to that? A wise friend of mine told me that about myself this week. And I said, that'll work really well for my sermon. Wink, wink to the right side of the room. People these days seem to desire too much acceptance from others. You have to be okay with people pointing out and laughing at you and sometimes being irritated with you, and you have to be okay with knowing you won't be invited sometimes. Can you be okay with that? Can you be okay with people going, oh, he's one of them, she's one of them? Or are we going to be like, Peter, Peter didn't demonstrate his spine at the cross of Jesus when they go, hey, aren't you one of his disciples? Peter goes, no, I don't even know the man. I'm like, no, 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 we saw, I'm telling you, I don't know the man. Back up. And he started cursing. I don't know the man. That's a massive denial of Christ, right? How many of you have ever done that before? Probably nobody in this room. So Peter's much worse than all of you in that moment. But we do deny Christ in many ways. We pretend that we don't know him. And how are we going to be the light of the world if we pretend that we don't know Christ? Listen, man, the world's made you think that you're a freak because you're a believer in Jesus. The world has stuck kick me signs on the back of every Christian, and they're laughing at the church. But the church, we don't have to fire back and be mad at them, but we can be strong in our faith in this generation, can't we? Can we be true to ourselves? Can we be true to Jesus? Can we worship in the church and then when we run into people in the world, still be true to the same God that we worshiped inside of this room? See, I'm calling on myself to step up to some of these standards in my life right now. I'm measuring my life against this now, and I'm calling myself higher. Who wants to go with me? As for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. If you have standards, you will be shunned sometimes. Jesus called you out of this world. Hey, guess what? Look at somebody and say this with me. You ready? I want you to go all in. When I tell it to you, I want you to do it with total conviction. You ready? Say it as loud as you can. You're weird. Come on, do it again. Say, you're weird. Now, what's really cool is if you're really sitting next to a weird person. Now, I want you to look at them and go like this. I mean it. Yeah. So, here's the thing. I looked up the definition of weird. Do you know weird actually means supernatural? I was like, wow, what? It means supernatural, and it actually, it also means this. I wrote it down. It actually means um, something supernatural, and it also means, this is so weird, a person's destiny. Your destiny is weird compared to my destiny. Every person was created for a weird purpose. And you know what else? Every person should have something operating in your life that makes you weird to the world. It's not of this world. It's supernatural. Come on. Yes, I'm weird. The Bible says this. Um, 
So basically, no, let me, before I say that, the, basically you're weird because you're out of this world. Look at somebody and say that to them. You're weird because you're out of this world. And isn't that true? You are out of this world. I am out of this world. My friend Roy Evie went to heaven this week. I was with him just 24 hours before he passed away. The last words he said to his wife was, I'll see you on the other side. And then he left this earth. Man, she was not afraid to see him go because her faith is so incredible. She said, Chuck, I'm okay because I know I'll see him again. There's faith in their whole family. I, haven't, I don't know if I've ever seen a family grieve like them. There's so much faith in the family that he's on the other side. Like literally he's a blink away from all of them. And he is. But man, so many people, so few people really get that kind of revelation that we are not, we are not of this world. We're of another world. Look at this. Dear friends, I warn you as, I love this verse right here. This is so cool. 1 Peter 2, 11 through 12, two verses. Dear friends, I warn you. As temporary residents and foreigners, and King James says, strangers and pilgrims. And the Amplified Version calls us aliens. Yup. Maybe that's how some of those cults end up looking for meteors to fly over. And uh, one verse <laughs> can, can ruin your life if you don't look at it in context of the entire Bible. But it says, Keep away from worldly desires that wage against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors that even if they accuse you of being wrong, they will see your honorable behavior, your standards, and they will give honor to God who judges the world, who judges the world. I, I warn you as temporary residents, as foreigners, as strangers, as pilgrims, as aliens. You see this kind of language here? It's really kind of wild when you read that in the Bible. And you also read verses like, you are a royal priesthood, a chosen people, a chosen nation, a people belonging to God to show forth the praises of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. He's saying you're not part of that. You are special. You are separate. You are different. You belong to the church. And I think this is one reason that I've been good at stand with standards. I don't mind being perceived as weird. Do you know that? Come on, guys. Like, honestly, the only reason I'm not weird sometimes is because Emily will call me out and be like, don't be weird. <laughs> if anything happens to Emily, you have no clue how cuckoo this guy can go. There's just a few people in my life that keep me normal. But, man, I am as weird as it gets. You better run while you can. If you're a visitor, don't ever come back to this church. <laughs> but I'm just saying... Um. I don't mind being perceived as weird. I kind of like it. I don't mind standing out. Witnessing my faith to other people has never been a problem for me. I'm not afraid of getting rejected. I, I've, it's so crazy over the years. I remember I was witnessing in Broadmoor Plaza. I, was, I, was, I just walked by this guy, and I was like, hey, how's it going? We struck up conversation, and I kind of went in for the kill too soon. <laughs> I was like giving him the Romans road before he could even, like, say hello. And... And the guy just took his drink and just shot it right in my face and walked away. This was literally 20, this was like 20, I'm not as radical, I'm not that radical these days. <laughs> but I want to be, again, the sermons like this, just call me out to just, it's okay to be rejected. Is it? And just go off the sermon for a minute and just think about how many people are living for approval and how much that's damaging you and how free you could be if it just didn't matter. Don't you wish you could just take that out and not care? Well, this sermon maybe can give you the grace to do that. Oh, this is funny. Watch this video real quick. It's funny. It's, good. it's fun being weird. Watch this. It's fun being weird. It's fun being weird. It's fun being weird. You should try it sometime. It's fun being weird. It's fun being weird. It's fun being weird. You should try it sometime. That's the weirdest video I've ever seen in my life. Awkward showing it, but it fits because it's weird. And hopefully that song is going to stick with all of you guys today. You guys are going to be on your motorcycle, all you men. You're going to be ripping your jerky off, going at the stoplight. You're going, it's fun being weird. And you're going to be like, it's fun being weird. 
I know. I choose to be stubborn instead of spineless. I choose to be true instead of trendy. And my closing idea is that I choose to have lasting influence instead of temporary approval. Lasting influence instead of temporary approval. See, if you go for approval, you're not going to win in the long game. You'll fit in, but you won't have influence. You'll walk away knowing that you could have made a difference, but instead you complied. I think there's going to be a lot of people in life, for the sake of wanting to fit in, they didn't stand out. And because they didn't stand out, other people couldn't have their life changed. And because they didn't get their life changed, you watch the rippling effect of somebody's life being destroyed because you went for the temporary approval instead of the lasting influence. I don't want to beat anybody up today, but I just want to say, if you want to raise the standards in your life, These are the choices you have to make, and they're tough, but these are the choices you have to make. I choose, I choose lasting influence over (laughs) temporary approval. So look at this. I wrote this in my notes. You will go through hell to raise your standards in this world, but if you do it, you'll have a chance to influence someone. I think there's nothing more cool than being not cool to shine for Christ, to only find out the person you wanted to be cool in front of comes to you and recognizes that you were more cool and says, show me your ways. And you give them your ways and then they come to Christ. When I first gave my life to Christ, I was rejected so hardcore. I bet my stories are on level with a lot of what you guys have gone through. But when I gave my life to Jesus, well, before I tell you that, just a couple of verses to put underneath of this. The idea is that some people reject you, but others will accept you. Not everyone's going to reject you. So look at he says. Here, Luke, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus said to his disciples, anyone who accepts your message is accepting me. Anyone who rejects your message is rejecting me. What's the idea here? That some people will accept, some people will reject. Sharing your faith Living right, living true to your values in a dark world is not going to make everyone happy, but it will make some people very happy. Instead of going to the negative side, go to the positive side and realize that for every five or ten people who aren't happy with your values, there's going to be one or two that are going to really benefit from it. Come on, guys. They're really going to benefit from it. They're going to go, thank you for standing out. You make a decision at a party. You make a good, responsible decision, and there's somebody weaker than you that decides to make the same decision because you stood with a spine, and then they can tell you later, I thank God that when everybody was doing that, I was able to not do it because you stood up and didn't do it. Man, come on, guys. I don't even know if these kind of messages are even acceptable in this generation, but, man, have a standard. Stand up and have influence. everyone. So the idea is, um, this is in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. It goes, it was by faith that Moses, when he grew up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to share the oppression of God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of sin. He thought it was better to suffer for the sake of Christ than to own the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking ahead to his great reward. Isn't that a great verse? Moses chose lasting influence over temporary pleasure. And that's why, besides Jesus, he's probably the greatest prophet to ever walk this earth. Are you with me? Besides Jesus, he did greater miracles than anyone to ever walk this earth. Why? He had to deny something so that he could choose God. And there's something you will have to give up. You're either giving up God or you're giving up something for God. You just have to choose. And if you choose to give up something for God, then you can have the full reward of having God. And that is much better reward. Lasting influence over temporary reward or temporary approval. So Moses chose that. Look at this verse here in Revelation. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this down. Blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, they are blessed indeed for they will rest from their hard work for their good deeds will follow them. Their good deeds will follow them. If you live right, 
if you live with standards, your good deeds will follow you and have influence for hundreds of years beyond your life. Um, and as I, as I kind of close this message, wow, I'm going to get you guys out of here so nice and early. This is so great. Thanks for all the text messages. I'll look at these. I always love when you guys text me ideas from the sermon, and I get to look at it later. It's just amazing. But um, I, when I first gave my life to Jesus, I, many, some of you have heard this hundreds of times. Um, but I remember my wife and I got in a real bad, so what happened was we were, we were getting drunk and smoking pot with my uncle every Sunday watching NASCAR, right? So back in the days of Dale Earnhardt Sr. And, I, and he, was, he was my guy, man. He, he, just, he was winning like crazy, and I was into it. And, but I remember we, so we get born again, and Emily and I are like, well, I don't know if we can handle the temptation. Let's just not go for a couple of weeks. And then we'll get stronger. Maybe we'll go. All right, cool. We'll do that. Well, then her and I get in this massive fight one night, and I leave her spinning gravel. My car you know, whipped around. I thought it was so cool, you know, how everybody does are making their exit. And they do something, they wreck your truck, and that's really dumb. Um, but anyway, I get to my mom's, and there's this big party going on. And it was like, there's like 25 or 30 of my family members. People were down from New York. It was this big party. And, and I walk in there, and I'm like, I'm not telling anybody I'm fighting because I, I kind of had already gotten some resistance. Like Everybody's like, what are you doing, man? Like, you're getting weird. I was like, yep, I am. So I didn't want to, you know, I was trying to be cool. So I walk in there, and I, I, grabbed, a, I, grabbed, a, uh, I grabbed a Pepsi. I put it up there, and I bowed my head to pray over my meal. And nobody had ever done that in my family in history, in the history of my life. So I bowed, and I was like, and I prayed out loud. I didn't even know you could pray silent yet. I wish I had known because it would have made it so much better. I was like, oh, God, he's listening, but now they're listening. Who do I? <laughs> I'm going to live for God. In Jesus' name, I thank you for this food. No, I, I just didn't even know how to pray then either. I was like, hey, sir, sir, um, thank you for this food. And I didn't, even, I didn't even just say amen or anything. I'm like, the end. And I remember I got done with the prayer, but when I was praying, the whole room got silent and everybody was listening to me. And I finished out my prayer while they were listening. When I got done, my uncle, who's with the Lord right now, he burst out in tears and walked out. I'd never seen him cry. His nickname was Tough, T-U-F-F. That's the way I always saw him, a tough guy. He walks out of the room crying. I'd never seen him cry before. Then one of my aunts walks up, puts her finger in my chest and goes, I don't know who you think you are right now, but you need to go talk to your uncle because my uncle was the one that I had been partying with on Sundays and then I wasn't partying with him. And so then I was like, man, I, this is doomed for me, man. So I walk outside, I'm talking to my uncle. He goes, you think we're all going to hell, don't you? And I was like, cop out. No, nope. I think you're all going straight to heaven, man. It's awesome. No, I didn't say that, but I was just like, well, I don't know, man. Only God's the judge, you know, something like that. Then all of a sudden, everybody had enough, and they one by one just started walking by me, and they're shaking their heads. I'm not making this up. Going to their cars, leaving, until even my uncle left, and then I tried to leave, and my dad was like, uh-uh, Buster, get back in the house. And he literally called me Buster. I remember Buster. So I go back in the house, and he's like, what is your deal? You're going to church. I think you're in a cult. You you know, how much money are you giving them? All this kind of stuff. I sent my mom a Bible in, 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 in the mail like two weeks later with the salvation. I wrote out how to give your life to Christ. She crumbled the letter up, uncrumbled it. She wrote with red ink, rejected across it, folded it back, stuck it back in the envelope, wrote return to sender, retaped it, and sent it back to me. But let me tell you something. If you're willing to be stubborn, and true, and go for lasting influence over a temporary reward, I can promise you by tested theories that they will come around at some point. My, my mom right here came, I led my mom to Jesus. She's the first one right here. I preached my mom's funeral. When my mom came to Christ, by the way, while the music was playing to my mom, whispered to my ear, she goes, you were right all these years. I don't know why I resisted you so hard. You know I was like big-headed after that. I was like, that's right. I was right about a lot of things. All those shots in the mouth, I just submitted to you, but I was right. 
Um, but no, just kidding. She was right. But I preached my mom's funeral. 47 hands go up at my mom's funeral of family and friends giving their life to Christ. We've had, we've had seven family members on both sides of the family die and go to Christ. Do you know since then, or a total, do you know I've had the privilege to lead every single one of them to Christ face-to-face while they're completely coherent, completely alive, giving their lives to Christ. My grandfather, who is like the mafia of our family, we come from New York, everybody's just mafia up there. My grandfather was, was like, kind of like bedridden all of his life. He went from the bed to the chair, bed to the chair, bed to the chair. It was his chair. I mean, that chair was like a throne. I remember the day God told me to lead my grandfather to the Lord, and I went there, and I was like, I'm going to try, I'm going to try, I'm going to try, and then I got scared. And I walked out, I called my wife from like, I think I had a bag cell phone back then. You know, I thought I was so cool with that. And I was like, she's like, did you do it? And I was like, no, I, I, I chickened out. She goes, turn around, go back to the house, go into the house, lead your grandfather to Jesus. Because I'd had this recurring dream that he died and he went to hell. And I woke up with my pillow wet because I was crying literally like Nightmare on Elm Street dreams, like where manifestations were happening while I was asleep. It was a, the craziest thing. My pillow was wet, I was crying, and I was like, Okay, she goes, go back. I go into the house. He says, what are you doing back so soon? I was like, there's something I've been wanting to tell you for a lot of years now. Can I talk to you? I had my Bible in my hand. I could tell he was like, oh, it's going down. And I said, so I said to my, I said to my granddad, I said, I started with Adam and Eve, the creation. I started with God all by himself. And Adam and Eve, and all the way through the Hebrew people and the and the system of worship and God choosing them, and all the way through the rehearsal for the for the one that would come and the Messiah and the fulfillment. I talked about the legal side of Christianity. I talked about all the practical side. I explained everything as if I was talking to somebody who never knew anything in all their life. And I get to the last ten minutes, and my grandfather starts crying. I had never seen him cry before. I'm not making this up. When I say never, I had never seen him cry before. And I said, can I lead you to Jesus? And he said, without hesitation, yes, please do that. I got on my knees in front of my grandfather's throne. I grabbed his hand. He squeezed my hand so hard, and I led my grandfather to Christ. I led my grandmother to Christ. First sermon I ever preached, my father-in-law came forward and came to Christ. He was a better man without Christ than I ever became with Christ. But he still needed Jesus. (laughs) Come on, guys. Why am I telling you all this? Because all I can say is this. When you, when you hold on, um, what, did I, what did I write down? The older you get, the more you see your greatest influence will not come from one big action, but from a few little actions done hundreds of times over tens of years. And if you're willing to be rejected, if you're willing to stand out, if you're willing to be stubborn, I can tell you the results, they will come. Amen? How many of you are ready to get stubborn? How many of you are ready to be true? How many of you are ready for some lasting influence? Can you say yes? Let's stand. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for everyone as they head out of here today. I ask you that. I want to pray right now. Man, if you don't have to go right now, just stand right there in your chair and just stand in front of God as if I'm Joshua and we're standing here in front of this big rock and we're making a covenant with God. And God, is Joshua's saying, what? What are you going to serve? Don't, don't just come to church and not come to church and come to church and not come to church. And, and, and it's not even about church. Don't just read the Bible once in a while and then don't read the Bible once in a while. And don't serve God and, and then not serve God and don't serve God and not serve God and, and serve God and not serve God. Make up your mind how you're going to live. Set moral standards and spiritual standards over your life. And this might take a week to do this. But this will be a great week for you as a family to meet together. Men, on Father's Day, you've got all the influence today. They'll do anything you say. Get your family around a circle and pray with them. Use that influence. He said, what do you want to do today, Dad? I want all my family to pray with me for a couple of minutes. I don't know. Father, I ask you right now to make us men of influence. Men of influence. Let us raise children that will serve you. Not because of one sermon they attended, but because of the way we lived for tens of years. I pray, God, that you would move in our lives. We thank you for those who have influenced us, mentors in our lives, people who stood firm and strong. 
unwavering. I thank you, God, that you're building back the spine in your church, God. And Lord, we don't want to be self-righteous. There's something worse than having a spine. That's to be self-righteous and arrogant. So to be firm, let us have plenty of humility mixed with that that we wouldn't be obnoxious with our standards, be those Christians that the world can't stand to listen to because we're always trying to set it straight. I pray, God, that we would bend down to serve the world, that we would be strong with good virtues of love and humility and service, and that, God, you would give us great influence and a great harvest and a great reward. In Jesus' name. Listen, if if you've never given your life to Jesus this morning and you want to do that, I'm going to stay here for a couple minutes at the end of the service. Please come up and let me pray with you. Otherwise, I I hope you have a phenomenal week. This would be a good sermon to chat up in the social network this week, talk about it with one another, and I wish you men the greatest Father's Day ever. In Jesus' name, amen.